Hey, we're in our, this whole year, the Lord is uh, having us talk through the phrase on earth as it is in heaven. And what really that prayer is, is I, I think sometimes we pray that prayer and we expect or we're anticipating for miracles, we're anticipating for healing, we're anticipating for all the, the fun stuff that heaven has. And what that prayer really is, is let me get the culture of heaven on earth in me. Whatever's in heaven, whatever principles, values, cultures, I, I want that in me. So th that prayer is really, uh, you're declaring war on your flesh. So you have to just walk us, I'm going to walk you through stuff. Just this, this year, you will have the opportunity to be offended at something. I can, I, that is a guarantee, money back guarantee. You will have an opportunity to be offended at something. I'll have an opportunity to be offended at something. If you don't think these sermons don't preach to me first, uh, they do. They wear me out. <laughs> uh, it's really what the Lord is saying is he wants a people that are set apart who carry the culture of heaven, who when they pray on earth as it is in heaven, they're not just praying for what they get, but they're, being, they're praying to be transformed into his likeness, into his image bearing. Does, are, are you guys excited about that? So now let's talk about money. I know you guys, you're so excited about this. And normally, you know, Pastor Robbie will tell a story or something in the offering or whoever's doing that. And he didn't because this whole, the next two hours, we're going to talk about money. Before we do that, let's pray. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Aren't you blessed? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you're in this room, that you've been moving, you are moving, and you're going to continue to move. I pray that you would, that I submit my tongue, Holy Spirit, anything you want said, say it. Anything you don't want said, I pray that you would hold it back and that people would be challenged and changed when they hear the word come forth this morning. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would convict and correct and encourage us through the word, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Real quick, I just want to take a step back and unpack what was happening in the room during worship before you go right. I'm having a hard time because it feels like every money sermon is just like random. Like there's no songs about tithing or giving. There's no announcements really about tithing or giving. It's just like this all this stuff's happening in the room and the Holy Spirit's moving to people and people are crying and people are laughing and there's dancing and like no one's giving during worship. I mean, it is an act of worship, but it just seems so ad hoc. It seems like so out of place, but it's really not. It folds into the context of all of us being on the altar for him. And this is really what the Lord brought to mind is Amanda and the team was singing this morning is 2 Timothy verse 1. I'm going to start in 3. And the title of this section of scripture, 1, 3 uh, through verse 7, it says, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Guard the deposit. So this is Paul writing to Timothy, who is a young leader. And he says, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I, re I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you, this is what was happening. So that part is really Timothy's history with the Lord. So you could insert your own history with the Lord. And this is 
Paul writing to Timothy, also writing to you. I don't know if you're a first generation or second generation or third generation believer. I don't know if you got saved last week. I don't know if you've been following the Lord for 40 years. It really doesn't matter. What Paul is saying is remember your first love and how we've spent this much time together and may that faith, may that ember, that's what he's really saying because this next phrase, he says, fan the flame. So he says that ember of your faith, don't let that die, cultivate it, put oxygen in it, fuel it and fan the flame of your faith. This is what was happening in the room. That's why you can have an artist and a dancer and someone up here crying and someone back there laughing all in the room because what the Holy Spirit was doing was fanning the flame, fanning the deposit that he's put into you. This is just what he wants in general. This is his God's general desire for the body of Christ, that the fire of God that's deposited in us would be flamed. It would be fanned into a flame that we would do this constantly. We would do this every day without ceasing. We'd be praying and devoted to him and through spiritual disciplines. Let me read this. For this reason, I'm reminded you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and of self-control, or other versions say of sound mind. Remember, we're supposed to take our thoughts captive. There's a lot of things in the church that defile our doctrine and theology. There's a lot of good ideas that were birthed into dark demonic corners. And that we, we just blindly accept without going to the scripture to really vet those things out. So when it comes to our money, when it comes to our time, when it comes to our, our talent, we have to make sure that we're not, we don't have ideologies and we don't have theologies and we don't have systems that are preventing our, the flame that God has put in us, the deposit that God has put in us from being extinguished. So we're gonna go really broad and talk about some categories and then we're gonna end with something very specific, right? Really generic. Now you know exactly what we're doing, right? I told you what we're going to do. The act of giving is a heavenly value because everyone in heaven gives. This is not a man-made tradition. This isn't a man-made idea. Giving time, talent, treasure, being a part of a community is not something that a guy, not, Adam didn't just think this up one day in the garden, hey, Eve, we should take an offering from the animals so we could build up our storehouse. This is something that heaven did first. This is the vow. So when we pray on earth as it is in heaven, we're praying that the generosity, the value of generosity that is in heaven gets in us. The principle of giving is a heavenly idea. Revelation 4, 10 and 11, the elders give their crowns and worship to the Lord. In the throne right now, there is a giving, there is a surrendering, there is a laying down right now at his feet. Genesis 2, 7, God gave us life. He breathed into our nostrils. Aren't you glad he did that? Can I just tell you, you wouldn't be here if he didn't. Okay, some of you are trying to get this. Genesis 21, 2, God gave Abraham Isaac. Exodus 4, 11, God gives man speech. This is what he tells Moses when Moses is like, I stutter. I know you're calling me to do that. And Moses is coming up with all these excuses of why he can't obey God. And God just says, I created your tongue. I created your ears. I created man to speak. And like God has all these trump cards throughout all of scripture. I mean, go read Job like 20 or 38 through 42. And you're just like, okay, I, what is man that you are mindful of me? I, I can't even fathom your goodness. I didn't make the sun rise or set this morning and you did. And here I am telling you what you're supposed to be doing. Second Corinthians 1, 11, God gives Solomon wisdom or chronicles. I apologize. Uh, Matthew 1, 20, God gave Joseph a dream when he needed one. John three sixteen. God gave us Jesus, salvation, freedom, deliverance, 
and the community of the church. Isn't that great? Acts 2, the whole chapter, God gave us the Holy Spirit. He poured out his spirit on all flesh. And guess what? He's continuously pouring out his spirit on all flesh. We, I mean, when you say you can't outgive God, it's not just in a financial way, but it's the breath in your lungs. It's not even yours. The, the spouse to your left or to your right, it's not, they're not even yours. That's God ordained, God designed, God planned, God given. The dreams you have, I, I mean, everything comes from above. And if it doesn't, it's blatantly obvious and uh, you probably need deliverance or something. The principle of giving is a heaven idea. It's a heaven's, it's heaven's idea first. When we pray on earth as it is in heaven, we're asking to be generous as heaven is. How many of you are ready to be generous, as generous as heaven is? Some of us are. I don't know if I am sometimes. Like I, after I do our budget, I don't know how generous I feel. Like we go to Costco and I just slip my wrist and give our firstborn up. Like, I feel like Genesis 22. I feel like we're putting Isaac on the altar every time. You know, it's, there's a, a joke uh, that what, you used to, what used to be your mortgage is now your Costco bill. What used to be your Costco bill is now your grocery bill. What is your grocery bill is now your gas bill. And you feel the pressures. It's hard when you have everything going on in the political world and the ec and economics of things and your paychecks and everyone's got their own financial reality that they have to wrestle with. But the idea of generosity and when we pray on earth as it is in heaven, we're asking for heaven's generosity that went bankrupt several times. It gave everything several times. And so when you look at the reality of what is versus the reality of what I'm praying for, that I would act and behave as the culture of heaven, there can be a chasm. And in that chasm, there's several justifications with scriptures and good intentions. Well, the Bible really doesn't say, or you don't really have to give your first fruits because none of you really own an orchard, Mimi. So you can't give fruit. So you're out of, you're out of that law or you're out of that burden of giving. But I will first, I, we have to take a step back. The idea of generosity is the heaven's idea. And when we pray on earth as it is in heaven, we're praying to be generous. We're praying to become generous people. Did you guys see that? I'm not, and we're gonna walk through scripture of how that is. So gener generosity starts with margin. Okay, it's not wise for you to hear this sermon and be like, yeah, let's be generous and go sell your house and your car and give everything and be completely broke tomorrow. Now, if the Lord's asking you to do that, you better do that. But don't take this and put your carnality and push something through that the Lord's not asking you to do. First, generosity is a principle. It's not the amount that we give and it's done within margin. Your house has to be in a way, it has to be in order so you know the margin in which you could be generous. In your time and your talent and your treasure, for so long we've been scheduling ourselves out to max capacity. We've been spending to max capacity. We've been showing up to max capacity. And the Lord says, hey, I want you to pull some of that back and live, from, live where there's enough margin in your finances, in your time, in your energy, in your mental energy, in your relationships, it's okay to pull back and give out of your margin. I love this, there's a whole, there's a whole theory about business, be, our business, our ministry through business, and there's a saying where he says, without margin, there is no ministry. If everything is consumed, if everything's eaten up and you don't have a plan and you don't know where you're at, and we'll, we'll walk through that through this series. But first we have to give through our margin. God loves a cheerful giver. I love what Randy says, a hilarious giver, an audacious giver, a, a, like something that will just make people crack up. Like, why would you do that? Why did you do that? 
And that's in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, and we'll get there here in a minute. All right, Matthew 25, let's talk about the area of stewardship because if generosity, if, if generosity is one leg in which we're supposed to operate or run on, stewardship is the other. You don't know what your margin is unless you actually have stewarded that thing. So for us to run in the fullness of financial freedom, what the Bible says, we have to have generosity on one side and stewardship on the other. You can't just give in the name of stewardship when you know they're gonna go buy a six pack and some other stuff that doesn't glorify God, that doesn't edify their body and is not pure. And you can't just say, well, I'm being generous. We're supposed to be generous, pastor. You're also supposed to be wise. You're also supposed to be a good steward. You're also supposed to sow your seed in good ground. So there's two, they're not, they're not at tension. They're not at odds. They work in tandem together. So go to Matthew 25, and we're not gonna read through the whole thing, but we're just gonna talk through the parable of the talents. And here you have this person of Jesus or that represents Jesus, and he's saying that the kingdom of, of heaven is like this parable um, where there's three servants and a one is given five, one is given two, and one is given one. Uh, the one who's, the, those who are given five and two, they multiply what they have. Now, a talent is a life, a talent is money, a talent is your actual talents. If you're good at mixing sound, you give that. If you're good at art, you give that. If you're good at singing, you give that. You invest that, you multiply that. You wanna multiply that through discipleship. Who are you in discipleship with? So this isn't just about money. This is actually about stewardship that we want to get in. If I have a skill and an ability, who am I meeting with regularly to make sure that that skill and ability is multiplied in other people as well? Right? So that's the same with my time, my talent, and my treasure. I want to invest those back into the kingdom. I want to steward those resources as well. I want them to multiply not only in me, but in others. That's the whole point of stewardship because it multiplies. So the one who had five grew it to 10. The one who had two grew it to four. The one who had one buried it in the ground. Now you've all heard this sermon. You've all been struggling with stewardship before and a pastor gets up here and uses this text and throws you an anchor when you really need a life preserver. How many of you have felt that before? And, you know, you've, you've gotten reamed and you're the servant, you're bearing your talent. And that could be true. That could be very true. There's times, there's days where I bury the talents. I bury the things that God gave me. Why is it? Because I was tired or because of this or because of the kids or because of a lot of several like good justifiable reasons I've buried talents or I didn't give when I was supposed to give. I didn't give the amount I was supposed to give. I didn't give the time I was supposed to give or I showed up to work late and I left early and I gave a really poor job. That's burying your talents. Did you know that? Okay, one person, Selena shook her head, so I'm good. So this servant who buried his talent, what happens? The servant, the master comes back and he's congratulating, oh, you had five and you made 10. Good job, but here's the kingdom, here's more. And then you had two and you made four and good job and you did it. And the one who has one, he's like, I was afraid. You uh, reap where you have not sown. I was terrified. I was shaking in my boots. I didn't want to let you down. I didn't know how to perform for you, Lord. So I just buried it. And here it is. I didn't waste it. I just have it back for you. And he says, you should have put it at least in the bank to, get, to gain interest on it. There's, there was some way where you could have just added to it, not even multiplied it. You could have just added to it. Like you could have done something. Your hand could have been on the plow, but you buried it. And then Jesus says, you evil and wicked, lazy servant. And then says, you'll go to the place where there's gnashing of teeth and mourning and give your one talent to the one who had 10. For those who have our steward, uh, steward will, will be given more. This is the kingdom of God. Welcome. Count the cost before you join. 
So this idea of stewardship is one, everything's the Lord's. Everything's the Lord's. Your time, your family, your marriage, your, your job, everything's the Lord. Once you possess the things, once you possess your possessions, they really possess you. That's why in Luke 10, he says, don't take anything with you. When you go minister the gospel, don't take anything with you. Because when we have possessions, then the enemy has something over us. He has leverage. If, I have, if I'm like Gollum from Lord of the Rings and I have several precious things that I'm holding on to, this is what it means when we possess our possessions. They really possess us. The enemy has power over us. Now we're not listening to the Holy Spirit. We're listening to whoever has control of the thing that we love the most, which could be our money, which could be our time, which could be our talent. You could love your kids more than you love the Lord. You could love your spouse more than you love the Lord. And if that is the case, I pray that the Holy Spirit reveals it to you and to know that you're out of bounds. He is to be number one. And all things. So stewardship means, stewardship has the idea that all of it belongs to the Lord. All of it belongs to the Lord. I'll tell you a story about stewardship. Our pastor and Trinity Church was preaching about this very topic. And he was talking, he went on a rampage about people who have dirty cars. And we had a dirty car. We were busy. I was in school. I was in ministry. I was working 40 jobs. We had a newborn. I, could, I didn't have time to go buy armor wipes and wipe down the dashboard of our purple 1994 Toyota Camry. I had time for that. It was a piece of garbage anyway. Why, why would I clean something that's already garbage? That was where I was at. And then He's preaching and he convicts me. And I'm like, duh, why did I come to church today? It's like, because my mom made me. I'm married and have a kid. <laughs> this is how I still think. <laughs> so on, after church, I go to Walmart. I buy all this stuff to clean the car with money that I didn't have. And I start cleaning this car and we're taking care of it. And then it starts to go really downhill after that. I told you about this car. Like there's no fuse boxes in this car. You put a fuse in, it would blow, but it would still run. It was a four cylinder and it, the, the second and fourth boot were the only ones that would stay in the cylinder of the engine. It had no AC in Texas. It was just, it, we, we marched around it several times <laughs> and laid hands on it. It, it. it ran on the Lord. It ran on the Holy Ghost. And um, we, we were ending up buying another car and we traded that thing in. And the guy who took the appraisal gave us $1,200 for it. It was like over 200,000 miles. I mean, there's no way. I was like, just don't pop the hood and we'll be good. But we started taking care of it, even though in our eyes, it didn't feel like it should be taken care of. And I can tell you, we probably have, we have to this day, we've been given several cars. From that moment, we decided that we were gonna be stewards in this area. And for whatever reason, the Lord just said, I'm gonna open up the door. I'm gonna give you several cars, I think. We had one, two, maybe five, maybe five cars total given to us because we decided to take care of the car. So stewardship says, it's not my car, it's the Lord's car. So I'm gonna take care of it like it's his. Because if this is the, the temple of Solomon, if this is the Holy of Holies, then it's really the Lord's. Are people impressed when they show up to the thing that you are called the steward? And that's really what we begin to look at. Uh, we're to take care of God's stuff uh, to ensure he's receiving the maximum return of glory that he can because that he is concerned with the glory that he's receiving. And he's not gonna share glory with anyone else. 
So stewardship is really taking care of God's stuff. That's like an overview, his money, his time, his talent, his strength, everything is his. When you walk into this building, it's God's. How are we taking care of it? Those are all questions that we should be asking. So let's go deeper into the area of finances because all there's a, several resources, the stuff you have. Again, your time and your talent is also an important resource that you're called the steward. But since we're talking about money, let's talk about money. So in the area of finances, I just need to let you know that money is a tool. It's amoral. There's a verse that we're going to read in the book of Timothy, and it says, the love of money is the root of all evils. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money doesn't care what it's used for. It doesn't. You can ask the dollar bill in my pocket or the hundred in yours. It doesn't care. I'm so glad. That was like a slow rolling joke. I was like, don't say it. <laughs> it started coming out. I was like, Mandy's not here to point at me. So you get the uncensored jokes because she's in the back somewhere. She's going to peek out right now. Money is amoral. It doesn't matter. And because it's amoral, it can be used for sinful things. And so part of what we're going to talk about the tithe is to redeem or to cleanse the money that comes into your storehouse. So we're gonna talk, we'll talk through that. that. That's a little bit later, but money is amoral. The love of money is the root of many evils, which leads to many pangs. And the word pangs is the same word that is used to describe how Judas hung himself. So when Judas hung himself, it's not in the traditional Western, he got a, a rope and a tree, but that he bought a cliff and he put spikes down at the bottom and then jumped off and was impaled by the spikes. It's the same way that Haman was hung in the book of Esther, 75 feet in the air. So when it talks about the love of money is many pangs, think through this, the love of money is, is in such a way that it's like every day when you love money more than you love the Lord, you hurl yourself off a cliff and you have many pangs, many spears that go through your body. So it could mean that a lot, maybe some of the problems that we have are, are there, where our view of money is off. It's off kelter. And we actually love it. Not that we have it or that you have a lot of it. It's not about the amount that makes it bad. It's how you feel about it. That makes it bad. I heard a pastor say earlier, okay, Mandy's in the room, so the jokes will cease. I heard a pastor say the other day, he goes, how much money is too money for a believer to have? I thought, I was like, ah, you got me. I'm paying attention. I want to know this. I start writing it down. I'm like, this is our goal. One dollar less than whatever this guy says. And he said, the amount of money that you have if it makes you forget who God is, it's too much. So if it's $100, if you have $100 in your pocket and you start thinking of things that aren't godly to do with that money, it's too much. I was like, man, that really puts things into perspective because it goes back to this verse that the love of money is the root of all evil because it elevates other things above God. So I don't want you to be impaled by many pangs. I don't want to be impaled by many pangs. In fact, the field that Judas bought to do that act on is still cursed today in Israel and will not be purchased and nothing grows on it. It's still, it, it is still inheriting, the land is still inheriting that death. And what did, he, what did he do essentially that led him to do that? He sold our Lord for 30 pieces of silver. So there's the parallels. Like we won't really go dive deep. Let the, if you wanna dive deep on paralleling those two stories, it, it should be really fun for you. <laughs> Thank you. Money is a tool to advance the kingdom of God. Money is a tool to advance the kingdom of God. I bet Daryl and Sherry, you're gonna hear from them on our mission Sunday, March 3rd. We're gonna take our one day offering for missions. I bet you hear from them that the money that paid for the plane flight from Palau to Hawaii was 
really advancing the kingdom of God and them. Because if that didn't happen, he might die on that island. And then the several people that they've left to, led to the Lord from that point to this day wouldn't maybe possibly not be in the kingdom of God. Burning Man costs money. The refrigerator we bought for John Brown Elementary costs money, but those teachers are extremely blessed. I got the opportunity to tour uh, the Children's Advocacy Center at Safe Passage where they, they're the only forensic place that conducts forensic interviews for children who have been in really, really bad circumstances. And I got to go meet the person who does that and Leslie Johnson hooked that up and I'm very grateful for that. And we're able to partner with Safe Passage because of the generosity of the church. The room that they conduct the interviews needs more sound um, dampening. And we're able to provide that. We're partnering with another ministry to also do some other stuff there down the line. We'll need to talk, Leslie. I'm, I don't normally like to crack eggs and announce things in sermons. Actually, that's a lie. I really enjoy it. So, <laughs> But this is a tool. Money is a tool in which the kingdom of God is advanced. Things cost money. I, I love the Facebook trolls, the Facebook theologians. Why don't you do that conference for free? Well, I don't know. Last time I checked, I don't get the lights for free. I don't get the heat for free. If they would, I wish that with as much vigor as they asked me to do stuff for free, they could negotiate the church's bills and get those down. I think that'd be great. But taking kids to campus, it costs money. It costs money to go to the camp. It costs money to drive to the camp. It costs, you know, it costs money to feed kids. We try to make them fast <laughs> to bring it down, but they just wouldn't. Less than a month ago, we baptized four kids who were called out by the Holy Spirit at winter camp that you partially paid for. You know why? Because you pay Pastor Aaron's salary through your tithes. And because you pay the salary of his salary through your tithes, through your obedience, he can walk out some of his obedience and some kids' names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what it does. This is a part of what this fuels. So when you talk about money as a tool that advances the kingdom of God, it is such a true thing. It advances the kingdom of God in your own life. It advances the kingdom of God in my, my life. It advances the kingdom of God in this church. It's a tool. It's not to be worshiped. It's not to be coveted. It's not to be manipulated out of people or drawn out of people, but it's a tool. And the, I just want to take a, I want to take a moment to talk through when I first took over the church. I don't like that phraseology. When I was first asked to be considered the pastor of the church, the month before our bookkeeper came to us and said, you're in debt, we can't pay anyone. I was like, great, what do we do? So I called my dad and my dad said, you need to cut deep enough where you only have to cut once. I'm like, okay, that's gonna stink because I'm the one getting cut, you know? When, when a church goes through anything financial like that, salaries are the only thing set. You can cut back, um, you can cut back ministry spending, you can do that. But if you don't have the event, then you don't spend the money. But if you have staff, you always, that money is always going out. It's always flowing out. It's a constant, it's a hard cost as far as running a church goes. So we met with the board, who's not our current board, but Darren was on the board. Darren Kennedy, and he had announced to everybody that all the plan that we were doing. And so we cut everyone back. And I remember she's moved since, but Jane Beaver got up and she said things that I wanted to say, but couldn't say. And her wisdom, she just began to say, we are tithers. And she shared a testimony about how when her husband died, she was tithing and she was provided supernaturally by the Lord, provided for her every day. So she, with her faith, this is what the body of Christ really looks like, with her faith, encouraged the church. Now, we staff still got cut by 20%. We still didn't do certain ministry things. I know we didn't do live nativity. I'm sorry. People are still hurt by that. 
There's certain things that we didn't do, but the Lord in the next 18 months made such a giant swing in our finances that it was unreal. And it was only things that he could do. It was only things that he could do. Now, as a church, what you ask yourself, uh, how, how much do you really need? If you're talking, if you're thinking about, if you're investing into this church, like it's an organization to invest in through tithes and offerings, you could be wondering, well, how much, it, how much do you really need? How much do you need of, of mine? And how much, well, and I'm glad that scriptures really lay out a percentage threshold for us because it's not about what the organization needs or the church that you attend needs. It's not about need, it's about obedience. I, I really wanna walk you through that because sometimes in Christendom and church world, we say, you know what? I, I do want to serve in kids' ministry, but it seems like they have all that they need. And what we do is we say, whatever is happening now is as far as God wants to go. Instead of saying, oh man, I could jump in here or I could do this or I can invest in his, this, and I want to multiply what God is doing. God's vision for our house is way bigger than we can think or imagine. God's vision for your house is way bigger than we can think or imagine. And when we give out of need or necessity, what we say is we say, I'm going to go to this high, this high is acceptable. And if God wants to do exceedingly more than I can think or imagine, I don't want to partner with that because I just want to hit the need. We sell the kingdom of God short. So if it's a tool to advance the kingdom, time, talent, and treasure, then we don't give what we need. We give what we're called to give. That's as simple as I can say it. So that's, that's what's serving. Man, they have a lot of prayer team. I don't know if they have me as a need. Oh, they've got lots of people going on missions trips. I don't know if I'm needed. Can I tell you that you're needed? You're needed because God wants to do more. Are, th are things okay? Are things settled? Will ministry at New Life still happen tomorrow? If you don't jump in, if you don't say yes, if you don't give, yes, it will because God has mandated it. But what more could he do if you partner and co-labor with him with all that you have? Because we're not giving up to need, we're giving up to what he wants, what he desires. Less of me, more of you. Your ways are not my ways. So I'm not gonna give up to my need. I'm gonna give up to his desire. That's a scary thing. That's a, that's a terrifying thing, isn't it? Man, I, I wanna stay here for a minute, but I'm gonna not. I'm gonna keep going. All right, tithe. Let's walk through the tithe timeline in scripture. Tithe literally means 10%. And so I know some of you and several blogs, I know, I know. It's Old Testament. I know, I get it. I get it. I also see it in the New Testament. And we're gonna walk through that. Listen, if you're reading, if generosity is heaven's idea, let me ask you this. If generosity is heaven's idea and you're listening to someone who claims to be a theologian who's telling you that you don't have to be generous, are they missing a principle of God? That's kind of where I sit. So rather if it's in the Old Testament or not, I still want to find God's heart through generosity and stewardship, right? Okay, that's, that's just me. I don't know if that's you. All right, Genesis 4, we see that Cain and Abel brought an offering. Abel brought an offering that was suitable and a, or Cain brought an offering that was offensive to the Lord. We don't know the percentage. We don't know the amount. We just know that it fit, it fit in their, what they were investing their time and talent in. They had an economic outflowing of that through either through sheep or through crops. And they brought an offering to the Lord. And it's not specific for a reason because it's not, the Lord is trying to establish the principle of generosity and his people back to him. And he's not trying to put a, a hook in us that says, this is what it is all the time. And now it does develop into something, it grows. It goes from an offering, then it goes to a tithe, then it goes to, I want it all. 
So if you really want to talk about a New Testament, a New Covenant offering, it's all of you. Okay, we'll get to that because enough. Are you guys excited? I can feel it in the room. <laughs> You're shouting me down. I'm just, my ears are overwhelmed by the, the noise coming up here. All right, gifts of Genesis 4, they cost time, talent, and treasure, and they worked within the economic flow. There's churches that have uh, businesses or business owners that they give goods and products. Uh, the church, one of the churches that my dad works for a few years ago got a few semi-loads full of just resources. Those are, those are good things. Gifts in kind, though, uh, of what you have, those are good things uh, to give that can be used. Genesis 14, you have Melchizedek, who's the order of the high priest. He's the ki- he's a king, he's a high priest and a prophet of Salem. You see him in Genesis 4 after, um, after Abraham defeats the five kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he doesn't want to take an offering or he doesn't want to take a gift from those kings, least that they say Sodom and Gomorrah make him rich. But he does uh, Melchizedek, who's a type of Jesus, and you can see this, the order of Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews, uh, who has no beginning and who has no end. Melchizedek brings an offering, or he brings uh, wine and bread, which represents communion, and that's what Jesus brought. And then what did Abraham, the father of our faith, bring? He brought a tenth of all that he had. He brought a tithe. So you can see the economic exchange is that heaven brings the bread and the wine, and Abraham brought his tithe. And that is what happened. This is what you call a salt covenant, that the covenant or the relationship happened at the table. It happened through looking at the, each other's eyes and saying, I will do this, and then you will do this, and we're gonna do these things together. So you have the tithe there in Genesis 14. You're more than welcome to look at it. Deuteronomy 14, 22 through 29, the principle of redeem, redeeming the tithe. So the firstborn belongs to the Lord. That's what it says. The firstborn belongs to the Lord. The first fruits belong to the Lord. So the Lord's not only concerned about a portion of your finances that you worship and love him instead of worshiping and loving it, but he's concerned at the, in the order in which he gets it. He doesn't want your leftovers. He wants to be first. He wants your time, talent, and treasure to be the first thing in his life. He doesn't want a vista to get paid before him. Now, you could you can design it in the order, and you can get legalistic about it, but it's really in the matter of your heart. If the tithe is a, oh, I forgot. We were looking good. I put some in savings, and I paid extra on the card, but I forgot to tithe. We'll get it next time. That might be something in the heart. If it's not in the order, in the rhythm of a priority, you might need to adjust something in your personal stewardship of your finances. I was gonna play a video. Maybe I'll post it later because it's on TikTok and people feel weird about TikTok. Uh, But this is testimony of this guy who planted lemon trees. Who's seen this video? Okay, this guy planted lemon tree a lemon tree. In Leviticus, it says, don't, uh, don't take a harvest for three years. And on the fourth year, take a harvest. So he follows Leviticus, Old Testament, old rusty, dusty Testament, <laughs> unredeemed, you know? And so he follows Levitical law. It lets the ground rest and doesn't take a harvest. And on the fourth year, he takes a harvest and he takes 12 lemons off this lemon tree and he writes first fruits on the lemons and then he puts in the basket. He's like, I felt like an idiot putting these lemons in the offering basket. The next year, the lemons that came back were the size of a softball and it hasn't stopped producing lemons the size of a softball. The principles work. The principles work. All right, Malachi 3. This is a famous one when it talks about tithe. Let's go there. I want to just mention a few things because this is just such a famous thing. It's talking about robbing God. It's talking about the Levites who are robbing God in the tithe. Okay, and some, some uh, again, theologians on the websites say, well, in context, this is the Levites 
and I'm not a Levite, so I can't rob God of the tithe. There's a huge jumping shark logic in that because when I read in 1 Peter, it says that we are a royal priesthood. So, priest who's called to minister in the presence of God, who hosts the very presence of the Holy Spirit, who is the temple. Oh man, don't get me started. You can rob from God. All right, let's talk about it. Okay, I was waiting. I was going to pause for amens. I thought there was going to be. For I, verse six, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Stop right there. Why is this in the Old Testament? Because God is saying, I don't change. I don't, it doesn't matter if this were written in the New Testament. I want to put it in the Old Testament. I want to put it in before the cross because I'm still going to remind you that I don't change. I'm not changing that. Oh man, don't, I'm just next, next line, Jeffrey. Oh, children of Jacob are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. But you say, how shall we return? Verse eight, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you? And your tithes and contributions. So tithe meaning 10% and contributions meaning anything above and beyond. Psalm, our proverb says that when you give an alms to the poor, it's like you're lending to God. And that the interest on return on that lending is far greater than any stock market or capital investment. Giving alms to the poor is a greater return on your finances than Vanguard or BlackRock or any other venture that you could ever go after. You know why I know that? Because God owns a cattle on a thousand hill. I know I've told you this. I just love to nerd out about these numbers. If there's a, a, if there's a cattle on a thousand hill and a, a, a hill is roughly like 998 acres, so that's an acre per cow and a cow costs $5,000, not including the fences and feeding the cows, that's $15 billion worth of cattle on one hill. He's pretty good. I mean, I think God's set. He's a great rancher and he's set. And what I also like to say is God owns a cattle on a thousand hill and you're the cow. I'm the cow. How is he going to bless other people? It's through me. Not everyone gets blessed with checks in the mail and it, pray for it. It's awesome. It's an awesome measure of faith. I, I expect a check to be in the mail every time I open it and then it's bills. And I'm like, okay, now you have another opportunity tomorrow when I open this box to do another check and not bills. Right? But sometimes, a lot of the times, you're the cow that he uses to bless people. Mm, okay, let's go. So God says, you're robbing me in this. You're robbing me in the tithe. Well, how do you rob God? And we're, we'll read it. But honestly, how do you rob God? If he owns $15 billion worth of cattle, if he makes amazing investments and incredible returns, if he could just create money and economics and if streets are made out of gold, do you think God needs your dollar? So honestly, how, like ask yourself the question because you have to take yourself out of this mind frame that it's about money. <clears throat> how are you robbing God? How are you, let's, well, let's keep reading. How are we robbing God? Okay, will man rob God? Verse nine, you are cursed, are in your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe of the storehouse that it may be food in my house and thereby put me to a test, says the Lord of hosts. So you rob him, and what it says is you rob him of the opportunities of this promise to remove the curse. Some of us want this curse removed from our life, but we're unwilling to surrender the area, in the area of our finances and our time and talent, and we continue to rob God from the opportunity to remove this curse from our life because we're partnering with finances, are we part partnering with the spirit of mammon? Are we partnering with something other than him? So he can't bless and sanction things that aren't partnering with him. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord. This is the only thing we can test the Lord. And 
uh, <clears throat> if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. That's pretty awesome. What he's saying is I'm going to rebuke the devourer from your life. I will, what does it say? Verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil. Well, if you don't have an orchard, brother, then this verse doesn't apply to you. But in metaphor, it does. The fruits of the soil, the fruits of the soil of your kids. Think through that. The fruits of the soil of your work, the fruits of the soil of your marriage, the fruits of whatever you're sowing into, there's a devourer. We know it from Matthew 13 that the crows and the thorns will choke out and steal, kill, and destroy the seed that is the kingdom of God that is put on any soil that is not ready to receive it. So God is saying, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that I will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fa fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts, then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Your land, your house, your spiritual soil of your body, the soil of your kids, the soil of your marriage, it goes on and on and on to infinity of everything that we touch that can receive the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. That's what this prayer really is. I can tell you testimony after testimony after testimony of how the Lord rebukes the devourer in our lives. I love it. Our car broke down this week. It'd been making a weird squeaky noise. So we had an appointment and then all of a sudden it smells like antifreeze in the car. So I think a belt got loose or a fan got loose and popped the radiator. But guess what? It did it like less than a quarter of a mile from Enterprise. That's convenient. This could be way worse. I was going to go buy pants in the valley. It could have happened on the side of I-90. But here we are driving around. Smoke's coming out. Well, we got to, let's go. So we go, we're able to go rent a car, which we have, we had the finances to do it. And we're called AAA. They get it towed. And I already had an appointment at Mike White. Everything was in place. Now you could say that, well, I, I read that scripture and I don't want my car to break down ever. I don't think he rebuked the devourer. I don't think you're believing enough, brother. I think you need to pray harder, journal more, worship louder. If anyone has had a car break down, knows that that could have gone way worse. You know what's by Enterprise? Jimmy John's, we're gonna go buy lunch. <laughs> this is, this day's getting better and better. So we get a tow to Mike White and the guy's like, oh, we won't get in until Friday. I said, no, I have an appointment Tuesday. He goes, no, I can't get it till Friday. I said, no, look it up in the computer. I have an appointment at 7 a.m. on Tuesday, and that's when you can get to it. It's just already here. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. So he texts me and confirms all that. It could have been way worse. The, we could have had a rental car for two weeks instead of one week. We could have been somewhere on the side of the road. Not by Jimmy John's. The sandwich was not very good though. So he, did I pray hard enough? Did I do enough? Did I get, it's just, this, this can go into a cycle that's super unhealthy and unprofitable. But I can bless the Lord for rebuking the devourer in our life. Could have been way worse. Could have been way worse. Another time, oh, I've got another car story. I was driving a car that someone gave us, but they wanted it back. I didn't know that they wanted it back, but that's a whole nother story. We were driving and white smoke coming out of the tailpipe. Oh no. I actually wasn't really paying attention until I couldn't press the gas anymore. Not mechanical, okay? This is not my gift. So uh, blown head gasket, engine's gone. So I'm like, oh man. We're poor and in ministry and have a kid. Like we can't even pay our house. How are we gonna pay to have this car, like have this engine flipped? 
So my uncle who lives in Vancouver, Washington, who's a very good mechanic, was actually in town in Lubbock that day. And him and my the, our other cousin went to a, uh, a yard and found an engine for $1,200 that then my dad paid for. And then my uncle and my cousin put the engine in the car and I was out $0 and zero time. And why was he there? I don't know why he was there. He was just hanging out. But why that car broke down at that time when he was in town, the man can tune an engine by ear. Like so talented. And I'm glad that he had the, the wits about him and the, the ability about him to give his time and talent to his nephew who really needed it. So he was a cow that was used to rebuke the devourer in my life. Do you see how this is working? Oh, I see, I've just got so many car stories. How this other, how you test the Lord in this and how this rebukes the devourer are again, another set of cars breaking out. This is why people give us cars, they're really lemons. <laughs> but you go from glory to glory <laughs> to glory. Hallelujah. So again, driving another car that's broke down, having a hard time paying bills, and we're walking Noah around. Y'all, Noah was lactose intolerant. So we had to buy goat's milk in Lubbock, Texas. That was $5 a quart. A quart. Right? Is that right? Yeah. It hurt every time. Anyway, so we're just walking Noah, our blessed son, who's costed us so much money. <laughs> and we're walking him and we're just praying and I just get something in me and I'm just like, God, we are tithers. We are faithful to tithe and these things are out of order. It seems like the, the devourer is not being rebuked in our life. What is happening? Would you vindicate us? Something is out of bounds. We're following the commands that you've put out in front of us in this area. These are your promises. Your promises are yes and amen. You, you don't turn on a shadow. You're not gonna lie. You don't change. I mean, just Bible, junior Bible quiz throwing out every scripture. I can and then a week later, one of our elders gives us a call. One of the guys in the church gives us a call and he's like, hey, just I want you to come uh, look at this car that I'm test driving. We're like, okay. So I go look over, I'm headed to class at Tech and I go by the dealership and I, I drive it around. I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. He goes, okay, cool. Uh, you can pick up the keys. We're gonna buy this for you. Like, wait, wait a minute. So we're going from lemons to driving cars off lots. Certified pre-owned. <laughs> we haven't got that new, new one yet. But glory to glory to glory. But it was almost instantly. What was that? That's true. The Lord had us give that car away. It was too, like he said, buy new tires for it and give it away. And I'll tell you who to give it to. So we did it. And then someone gave us another car like two weeks after that. Are you, I'm telling you, you just, you can't make this stuff up. So how does he rebuke the devourer? He sustains things that shouldn't be sustained. Like your shoes in the desert, like sound equipment. Tim, all this stuff should be dead. But Tim and the grace of God and Pat Robertson's protein shakes are keeping this thing together. <laughs> Probably a little duct tape. I'm telling you, there's things that should be dissolving, that should be dead, that aren't because a tither is touching them. Because you're walking in a blessing that only giving, only generosity allows. I'm gonna read that again, okay? Okay, we had a friend, I wanna say this story. We had a friend um, and he's a doctor now and he was doing his schooling in uh, the Dominican Republic and him and his wife were in this apartment that was just run down, he said. 
And he's really the one, I was at his small group and he talked about this and told me this testimony about rebuking the devourer. And then two weeks later, I prayed the prayer about rebuking the devourer. And then a week later, we someone gave us the car. So this is, we overcome by the word of the, the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. He just told us for two years when they didn't have any money and they were both in med school, the Lord literally anointed all of their appliances that were already 20 years old in the Dominican Republic and they never went out. Their, every neighbor had shorts in their washers, not like shorts, <laughs> short circuit. Like the electrical didn't work and this would go out 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 and this would go out. Would go out. I'm telling you, there's something in this. So let's keep going. I want to end sometime. So the full tithe provides food in the storehouse. So what I was alluding to other earlier is that when you tithe, that's when things are, are bought. We can buy meals. We can buy refrigerators. We can and buy spray foam for children advocacy centers who are doing conducting forensic interviews for kids who need a safe, protective place. So that the storehouse, the church gets full. So when people say, well, why doesn't the church do it? Well, I can tell you a national giving for church overall is at 1.8%. That's why the church doesn't do it. Because people have decided from the 60s that they're gonna vote in such a way that government institutions will just take care of the people. And because they vote in such a way, they don't have to give to the church as much anymore. Okay, now I'm, I'm gonna just hop into something else and let that simmer. So if there's not food in the storehouse because the people or the priest of the house aren't filling up the storehouse. I'm not necessarily saying that about this church or about you, this is just church in general. It used to be said that in giving, churches 80% of the people did, or 20% of the people did 80% of the giving. In the last five years, that has changed and it hasn't gotten better. Now it is 10% of the people do 90% of the giving. And it is, that is actually giving overall for the church has increased by 8.4%. 4, 8 and all that has done is made the 90% of people who don't participate in this spiritual act of worship celebrate their lack of participating in the spiritual act of worship. And that only happens if the church has an integrated, specific giver, giver's caring program. So the storehouse isn't full. Why isn't the church doing it? Well, there's only, we're limited. Our God's not limited, but sometimes your balance sheet is. Um, it's not about money to God, but it's about the opportunity. He wants the opportunity. He wants to bless you with opportunity. Sometimes you want the check of the mail and he gives you a job application. You fill that sucker out and get to work. It says that a lazy man in Proverbs doesn't deserve to eat. It's like, I know you're filled with compassion to help people out, but if they're genuinely lazy and hunger is the fruit of their labor, let them eat. That's why generosity and stewardship have to go hand in hand. We can't just be giving willy-nilly because the Holy Spirit might be doing something in them to break a generational curse of laziness in their family. He's trying to break off poverty in them. But you come and give them a supplemental income. Yikes. I, I'm guilty of this too. It's not just you, it's me. It, it says that a lazy man puts his hand at the plate and can't even get it up to his mouth. How far gone do you gotta be? <laughs> right? So that's not just physically, that's not just in, in the opportunities that we have to make money, but that's also spiritually. Uh-oh. I mean, I, if I can step on your toes, how many of you put your hand to the plate of what the Lord is offering and you never put it to your mouth to eat it? You can never utter the words of Ezekiel and says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Honey is never on your lips. There's cold never on your lips because your hand is still on the plate asking God to fill you with more. 
Because that was free. That was not, not about tithing, but let's get back to the notes. Blessing poured out down from heaven. And we have, I know that there's a word of faith movement. There's blab it and grab it, uh, claim it. Claim, what is it? I was like, claim it and fame it. <laughs> Break you off a piece of that fancy feast. Shots all over the map. Name it and claim it. This verse, that, that verse in Malachi has been abused for people who, of the word of faith of the prosperity doctrine. Did you know that blessing is all throughout the Old and New Testament? God desires to bless. He gives gifts. We just read about how God gives. Generosity was his idea. Now, if you're out of bounds and you still want God to bless you, then I'm sure, certain that he won't. Deuteronomy ends with this picture that we all need to claim for and claim and fame for ourselves. <laughs> right? It's, God says, if you do my will, you will live on this mountain of blessing. Isn't that great? And if you don't do my will, you will live on this mountain of curses. That's what Malachi is referencing. He's saying you're out of bounds, you're on the wrong mountain, and the windows of heaven are pouring out over here where the blessing is, where the obedience is, where the relationship is, where the intimacy is, not over here where you're trying to build your own kingdom, where your hand is still on the plate where you're complaining about everything, when you're comparing yourself to how good everyone else has got it. Mm, okay. You know it's good when people start mooing. Mm. It rebukes the devourer. Some of y'all are just, you're trying to do deliverance on things that you don't have the authority to rebuke. Giving rebukes this devourer. Your holy water, your scriptures, your be everything will fall short in rebuking this devourer unless you are tithing, period. Unless you're giving, unless you're partnering with heaven financially and your heart is surrendered to his and you're on the mountain of blessing and not of cursing. I wish we had two mountains. That would be great. All right. First fruits will not be destroyed. Isn't that great? That's good. First fruits will not be destroyed. Your vine shall not fail. All nations shall call you blessed. Now, if your motivation is to be bl called blessed by other nations, you're out of bounds. But still the testimony of who we are to be a city on a hill, this is all a part of that. Why is an unbeliever gonna ask us why we have so much good going on in our lives if we're not to be called blessed because we're not tithing, because we're not partnering with God financially? because the devourer has free reign over our life, because we rob God of every opportunity to open up the windows of heaven on our life. People aren't gonna call us blessed. That's not a very good testimony of his glory. I don't think it is. All right, Matthew 23, 23 says you ought to do. Let's go there. I'm gonna flip there really fast. Matthew 23, 23. If you get there before me, just start reading it out loud. Matthew 23, 23. This is why you bring your Bible to church. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. He says both. Are there greater things? Yes, justice and mercy of the law. But the other side of it is, is without the tithe, the arm of justice and mercy through the church body is gonna be shortened. It's the truth of the matter. So Jesus is saying, here he's correcting, he says, you should have done both. You should have done both. So it's not one or the other, it's both. All right, Matthew 6, uh, 24. Let's go there. Man, I'm beating all of you on my sword drills. It says this, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. 
This is an act of worship. If you're unwilling to give to the Lord and have your finances partner with him and his kingdom, it's possible that you're serving money and not him. You're elevating money to a higher place than he is. I know hard times. I know financial hardships. I know inflation. I know all those things. I know all those things, but this has got to be first. And then all the other stuff is figured out. Second Corinthians 9, 6 through 15. I've got it marked, so I've already cheated. Says this. The point of this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may bound, <clears throat> abound in every good work. That's Paul is referencing Malachi in there. Not only will the, the devourer be rebuked, but your fields will be blessed, your vines will be blessed. Everything that you put your hand to will be blessed. That's what he's calling back to. So Malachi is not just an Old Testament idea. Paul is referencing to it right now. As it is written, he is uh, distributed freely. He will also give to the poor his righteous doors forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread of food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. That's God who is the supplier will increase the things that you give. He will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will all produce thanksgiving to God. This is about his glory. Oh man, if we can catch that. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpensable, inexpressible gift. So this is why we give. It's not for a tax credit. It's not to look good. It's not to sound good. This is why we give, because it's a principle of heaven. The act of giving is a heavenly value, and we're, we are praying on earth as it is in heaven. In me, as it is in heaven, the values of generosity and stewardship that exist in your throne room, let they ring true in my life. That is the point of the prayer. Now, in the next few weeks, we're going to dive deeper in stewardship and we're going to dive deeper in all, all those things. So this is more of an overview. If you'd stand with me as we close again, it feels weird because you don't really, how do you do an altar call for giving everyone who's not giving? It's, it's awkward. Yeah. Come bring all your money. And your earrings. <laughs> so what's, what's the response that the Holy Spirit wants from us today? One, I mean, if you heard the word and were convicted by it, you need to take a minute where you're at and talk to the Lord about it. Or if, at least commit to talk to the Lord about what we just discussed in scripture. If there's something that doesn't resonate with you, um, talk to the Lord about it. It's not about you. I, we didn't write the scriptures. He did. It's his word. It's his way. It's his commandments. It's not ours. If there's any fleshly, un, uh, ungodly wisdom that you have about finances, Ask the Lord about it. If you, don't, if you have money and you don't know what to do to invest it, ask the Lord about it. If there's something you're supposed to do to give or to be generous, ask the Lord about it. He wants to partner with you in your finances. I know your parents didn't talk about money, but God is fine talking about it. 
he's willing to have an open and honest conversation about it. So I'm going to invite the ministry team to come forward. And here's what we'll do. <clears throat> These people are here to pray for you and with you. If you need anything, because what I don't want is like, man, we talked about money this whole time, but my knee is bugging me. Or I'm battling cancer. And so the response to the sermon that we just did, go one-on-one -on -one with the Holy Spirit and ask him if there's anything in your life that's in error. And if you want to talk about it, we can, we'll, we can go to coffee and talk through it. But if there's any physical needs in the house, if there's any physical needs in the house, and, and I want to pray also for prodigals. I just keep burning. It's like this burden in me. We want to pray for prodigals. If you have any physical need in your body or if you have prodigals that you're praying for, I'm going to ask that you just respond. I'm going to start praying and then you can walk up front and get prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. I just want to just pastor you a little bit. If you took Advil this morning, you should be walking up here. This is the time that the Lord wants to touch the pain in your life. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that it's alive, it's living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. I thank you for any conviction that fell on the body today. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would begin to speak to every heart in the room, that they would uh, um, surrender themselves to you that the principles of heaven can get in them, that we can truly pray on earth as it is in heaven. As you're generous in heaven, be generous through me. We give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Prodigals, physical things, come and get prayer. We love you. We'll see you next week. Be blessed.